The show will start in one minute. The show is about to start. Thank you for your cooperation. Enjoy the show, and please come back and visit us again. The Earth is a place that holds many secrets, paranormal hotspots and enigmas waiting to be revealed. Some of these locations have captured the interest of investigators of all kinds, UFO, cryptid, ghost researchers, scientists, engineers, and in some cases, even the government. Though many of these locations are spread around the United States and around the globe, they're usually known for one type of phenomenon. In a few instances, there are locations that grab the headlines and the imagination of people far and wide because contained within these rare spaces are accounts of light anomalies, UFO sightings, creature encounters, and wraith-like beings coexisting. The Bridgewater Triangle, an area roughly 200 square miles nestled within southeastern Massachusetts. The Skinwalker Ranch, a 512-acre property in Utah, are two of the most famous and well-known. Recently, I was introduced to another such property within the great state of Missouri, an area about 2,200 acres in size, the Marley Woods. This property has been investigated and grabbed the attention of researchers like Ted Phillips, Jacques Vallée, and our special guest. Today, we explore the mystery of the Marley Woods with our guest, Thomas M. Ferrario, next on the Paranormal 60 with Dave Schrader. I'm not going to stand here and listen to this baloney. He won't float. He doesn't stand for baloney. Sounds like a lot of supernatural baloney to me. Supernatural, perhaps. Baloney, perhaps not. What is it about certain locations that seem to draw levels of high strangeness? Locations where the lines of the outer limits and the twilight zone seem to intersect. Our guest knows firsthand and follows in the footsteps of a legendary investigator with a remarkable pedigree for researching UFO and strange anomalies, Ted Phillips. Under the guidance of Mr. Phillips, Thomas M. Ferrario continues to investigate and document the Marley Woods seeking answers. Mr. Ferrario has worked as a dive master, machinist, and electrical engineer on projects in the United States, Red China, and Bermuda, and has been an independent UFO researcher since 1969 to 1998, at which point Walt Andrus, founder of MUFON, asked him to become a section director for MUFON. Later, he would go on to be the assistant state director of Missouri MUFON, where he then founded the MUFON dive team with Debbie Ziegelmeyer. Thomas then joined Ted Phillips as his assistant in 2006 and later became part of Ted's SIU team, where he went on to assist Ted Phillips on his Marley Woods project and his Tetra Mountain Moonshaft project. I'd like to welcome, for the first time to the Paranormal 60, Thomas M. Ferrario. Sir, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Glad to be here. Of course, good to be anywhere. Right, exactly. Uh, <laughs> let's let's jump right into this. How did Mr. Phillips become acquainted with the Marley Woods? Actually, uh, Ted was brought into the case by a gentleman named Bruce Whitteman, which was the state director of MUFON at the time. And uh, they were good friends, I will say, from lectures that Bruce had him on. And uh, Bruce was contacted by the property owners of Marley Woods 
And the initial contact when Bruce turned over the files to Ted, I will say Ted wasn't too interested. But when he read the documentation and it so was similar to what he had experienced overseas working for Dr. J. Allen Hynek, that Ted, quite frankly, was worried that uh, bad things would happen at Marley. So he so many people wonder why did Ted spend the rest of his life basically in Marley Woods? And when he got to Marley, as Ted says so often when he worked for Dr. Allen Hynek, that he was chasing breadcrumbs. And Marley was one of the few places he experienced things live himself in light ball phenomena, structured craft, and cryptids. So that's why Ted got involved in Marley. And it, it goes far beyond that, right? I mean, there are also accounts of, of poltergeist and spirit-like activity. You're yeah. familiar, obviously, with Skinwalker Ranch. Do you believe that this location itself measures up or far surpasses that of what's been detailed at the Skinwalker Ranch? Well, I will tell you, and I can speak about it now for a while we couldn't, but we were affiliated with Robert Bigelow for a time. Okay. Uh, his people spent time at Marley. And, of course, the great Jacques Vallée spent time. He was Ted's close friend and worked with Alan Hynek and Ted together as a team. And Jacques spent time with us, along with Douglas Trumbull, the special effects wizard on Close Encounters and right. others. And um, Jacques came a a away from believing that Marley had a higher potential for high strangeness than actually Skinwalker. And Jacques spent a lot of time at Skinwalker. And um, I will tell you, as far as the paranormal aspect of it is, Ted in the beginning actually had an outing with Dr. Hynek. Uh, as he said, Dr. Hynek and Jock were so far ahead of his time that it, it got into the realm. You know, Ted was a nuts and bolts man. He wanted to deal with a structured craft. He didn't want to go into paranormal. And I myself in the beginning, when I was trained, I was a member of MUFON and went out on cases with a retired Air Force captain. Uh, it was all nuts and bolts. And But the paranormal has entered this. And as Ted always said, he went where the data led him. And believe me, we both came away believing, and as Jock said, that uh, this is paranormal. It's all one and the same thing. Uh, little structured craft coming from Alpha Centauri is too simplistic a view. And as my mentor, as Jock always told me that, we have evidence that the phenomena has the ability to create a distortion of the sense of reality or substitute artificial sensations for the real ones. Now, what that says in a nutshell is that this is all frequency driven. It's dimensional, interdimensional. And when you're in that realm, as we experienced in Marley and Ted proved and Alan proved and Jock and even at Skinwalker, they're going into this now proving themselves that this is all more interdimensional than interplanetary and phenomena and poltergeist type activity we experience. It's all one and the same phenomena. Now, that's saying that's quite a statement. And uh, that Ted certainly didn't want to is. deal with that. <laughs> right. Right. Well, I, I would guess you want to first, before you try to wrap your, own, your arms around the entire anomalous features of this let's let's take each piece one by one he is a ufo investigator he's he's part of this realm so let's start to dissect this if that falls apart then it's probably pretty easy to discern that the rest will tumble like like uh, uh dominoes as well yes. um but as he's seeing more and more of this taking place i'm curious uh the thoughts behind this, you know, to, to see that there is multiple instances, almost like a nexus of, of paranormal activity, or do you believe that is just one source cloaking and pretending to be cryptid, pretending to be alien craft, pretending to be ghosts in order to trick us? Or is that maybe too simplistic as well? No, that's actually a quite accurate statement because you, as you touched upon there, it has the ability and I will, you know, warn anybody in the paranormal and especially in ufology. And believe me, there's still a lot of ufologists that don't want to get into this realm, but you have to always keep in your mind that this phenomena has the ability to make you perceive things. Now, what it would like you to perceive or experience and fear is a part of that. And it uses fear at times as a tool. 
And as Ted always said, and when we were there with Jock, we felt at times this phenomenon was experimenting on us, monitoring us as much as we were there to monitor and experiment on it. So, but always keep that in the back of your mind that what you see and experience may not be the whole story. Now, when this comes through the, the portals, or Ted said, and believe me, at one time, if you'd have said portal, Ted said, you'd have had to knock me over. But we experienced portals in Marley. We've seen this. Now, we've seen now things. please give us a definition. When you say we, we've seen portals in Marley yes. Woods, what are we seeing like the Stargate with the giant circle opening and something stepping through it or just a, an energy shift, something that, that takes place that is measurable but maybe not visible? You're, you're close in, in some aspects, sometimes, not always. It can be very visible. And we actually, what we call the light source, we have photos of this occurrence. Uh, we actually observe things, Ted seen things come through this light source, we call it. Uh, at other times, in, a, in an instant, we feel this stuff, when it doesn't want to be observed, has the ability to come and go through this dimensional boundary. And now that really gets tricky, I, I will tell you. Um, but we, we virtually, we, see, we've seen it all there. And a lot of the cryptid activity, we all believe it comes from one common source, as you said, uh, this stuff is interdimensional. And when it comes through, it's as real as you and I, and when it's not there, it's not there. You could go through Marley woods with a thousand men hand to hand, and you'd never find it. But when it's there, it leaves as Ted and in, was involved in physical trace and we have we have physical trace cases we have you know now, we have hairs. physical trace let me okay so hairs yeah. which i was going to say you, you know wondering if this is something projecting to our mind's eye creating these illusions for us is it possible that this is more of a holographic experience but you just said that it would leave different phenomena different anomalies would leave behind trace evidence yes it it, it clearly does and uh okay at times when it crosses a dimensional boundary, uh, we have property owners that our largest, one of our strangest cryptids was a large white polar bear. Now this sounds strange, polar bear slash sloth type of critter. And the property owners of cattle, he can judge cattle on the hoof within poundage. And he estimated this thing at four to 500 pounds, uh, shot it, he claimed, made it red. Um, Ted and I got out there we found hair samples where it crossed through a four strand barbed wire fence, 16 inch long white hairs, which nothing in that area has, left physical tracks where Ted did actually compaction test, estimated the, the, the weight to be about what the property owner had said. We did microscopy on the hair samples and DNA work, came back no known match. So, there you have an instance. Now, do we believe there's a living breeding population of these things out there in Marley? Absolutely not. We know there's not. But as I said, when they cross through, they're as real as you and I. And the interesting thing about the dimensional aspect of this, this cryptid was the property owner said he's seen this thing pass through the four strand barbed wire fence. Now, when I say pass through, he said it was as if this thing dematerialized and de materialized on the other side of the fence in the process, somehow leaving 16 inch white long hairs. Now hmm. that gets about as strange as you can get. <laughs> did, did he talk about this creature being sentient? Obviously animals are sentient to a, to a degree, but as if it was more than just a polar bear roaming, looking for the next seal to snack on, but as something more, alien in nature and more intelligent as though it was a you know an apex thinking creature in its own realm yeah that that's one of the things you hit upon there that's absolutely true we always have a sense we're dealing with an intelligence now one of the strange things about this cryptid was it was seen more actually walking on upright on two legs than all fours and it was sighted several times in this area for a brief period. And so many of the cryptids in Marley are what we call one timers. You, they're seen one time, they're experienced a number of times, and then that's it. Not before or not again after. So we have that. And 
you know, are there are there specific sites on the property where we know this is where these things always come in from so we can set up cameras to catch them stepping into our realm that's one of the things we dealt with on the acreage you know it was such a vast area that we the stuff would pull our team to one end of this ranch to another when things were sighted we'd be at one end and then we'd have to get to the other end um certain cryptids there are locales that are common to these things which we do have cam we had cameras at um and we had caught some imagery of this and we do have some of the white the cryptid and um you know the only bigfoot sighting in in the county was right in close proximity to marley woods but let me tell you we have the strangest kind of uh skinwalkers type sightings uh, we have hooded figures walking in sequence to a local cemetery uh, when the property owners had seen what he described as one of these having a wolf-like face, which I don't have to tell you relates to Skinwalker. Right. Very great. Are, are the you saying the hooded, the hooded figures had wolf-like faces or yeah. there were hooded figures and wolf-like creatures? No, actually... <laughs> The caretaker, the one of the proper, we had what we called site one, site two, and site three. Right. And our base camp office was on site one that the property owner built for Ted Phillips. Very nice structure, two-story structure with a deck. And um, but the the prop the property owner's caretaker had seen this, and the property owner had seen this one time. But uh, the caretaker had, had chased this object. He seen six of these type of floating. He described hooded figures. He shot at one and the one at the end turned around and faced him, which he wished it wouldn't have. Mm -hmm. And as he described it, and believe me, the process getting this from the man was very intense and it took a long time because he didn't want to talk about it, but he described it and he said, you won't believe me, but it had a face like a long wolf type face. Now, uh, that gets as skinwalker -ish as you can get, you know, and in the early accounts of skinwalker, uh, they had similar things as this. Right. So uh, I want to bring up a point and, and especially with what you just described, um, because I know that, that your mentor in this, uh, Ted Phillips was quoted as saying, my approach is the same one you now see on television shows like CSI. You must always handle a UFO scene with care as though it were a crime scene. So knowing that when you go in, are you are, are there any kind of uh, protocols in play to talk to the eyewitness as in medical, mental health, drug, alcohol abuse, anything to understand that, you know, maybe this person's just a little off. Yeah. And, and, and Ted was an expert at that, I will tell you. And, and I had a background of that also from MUFON. I learned from a retired Air Force captain and, and, you know, even in MUFON, the mutual UFO network, when you investigate a UFO sighting, uh, you learn even just little things like body language as you're interviewing a witness you don't interject any casual body language any you know just even right. nodding as we tend to do um <laughs> you you don't influence the witness in any way shape or form and you just take their testimony and there's a process you go through you can pretty well discern if someone's telling the truth or not and and ted was a master at that i will tell you and and ted is was like alan Heineck. he could walk up to anybody and within five minutes, he would be a close friend with a, with a gentleman. And um, so, but that's the way we did the scientific approach. And we, we went in with as little a footprint as we could possibly. Um, and that's just the way we rolled with Ted. You know, that was his, his, his method, out, method. And uh, that's what we adhered to. So in witnessing these things, craft, light anomalies, creatures, yes. humanistic wraith-like creatures, poltergeist activity, and I think reading through uh, the information I found that you put out online, things would be in one place one minute and then vanish and two days later appear somewhere else completely different. So we've got a lot of this apportation portal dimensional feel to it. And I don't want to put you on the spot, but if, if you had to give me an answer to what you thought was going on there, what you believe not what Jacques Vallée or Ted Phillips or Ben Hansen believes, but what do you believe is taking place on this property? I, I truly believe it's a unique place. And as Ted, we worked, believe me, we worked long and hard 
trying to find out what differentiated Marley Woods and places like Skinwalker from any other locale. We could never come up with anything geologically or anything. Um, I truly believe it is a location, one of the few places that, and it is a worldwide phenomenon now. There are places like this, but I do believe it's a place where there are, there is an intelligence that comes through at times dimensionally. And I believe it's at times it's to use, to use us as a living laboratory, as much as like Ted said, we were a living laboratory to monitor this stuff and do experiments and monitor. I mean, we monitored everything out there. Um, but at times we felt like this intelligence we were dealing with directly uh, always had the upper hand on us. And I could go into things at instance like that. Uh, and, you know, even when we had individuals like D Douglas Trumbull out there with, he was manufacturing a very high tech piece of camera equipment. He put mm -hmm. in one of the cabins and set it up and in a locked room the next morning, Jock Vallee, myself, Ted and Douglas went in the room and the camera, 75 pound camera locked on a heavy tripod was turned 90 degrees away from the window where it was put to monitor things. Mm. So we did have poltergeist activity like that. And, you know, that stuff you just can't explain in any other, any other way. I need to know in doing the research, is there scientific measurable things? Are we seeing spikes in geomagnetic principles? Are we seeing uh, any kind of put off and what is it? Yeah. Yeah. We've had, actually, we've had high EMF recordings. We've had high in the radiation spectrum of microwave energy, which we feel we've had cattle mutilations out there. We had a mm -hmm. horse and I won't go into that now, but we had a horse in the barn that was virtually blown to pieces in a matter of minutes from a caretaker being there. Um, and we've, we've recorded microwave spikes uh, in a couple agroglyph areas, which some people call crop circles, but we, Ted always called them agroglyphs or saucer nests was the old terminology. Uh, we did have in a couple instances, we had uh, high elements of, of ra radiation in those sites. So we did have measurable uh, data that we had, that hmm. we took away from it. Were you able to tell directional? Was it coming up from the earth? Was it coming down from the heavens? Was it coming east to west? <laughs> how, how were you able to measure it? That's a good question. You know, uh, we never were actually able to point a finger. Now, a lot of the old timers and the property owners thought this, a lot of this was coming from subterranean caves and, and uh, we never found any caves at Marley. We did find some large cave complexes near Marley within miles that we felt went under Marley, but we did not find any access, uh, yeah. which we had phenomena called light balls was our most common activity. Uh, but now, light is that balls, something, is the light yeah. ball something completely different than ball lightning yes. phenomena? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So... And, there is this, a measurable difference between what you witness and ball lightning, which is a real phenomena, but it's a natural phenomena. Absolutely. And the difference I would just like to point out there again is, and this really gets tricky, but the light balls we feel actually showed intelligence also uh, in mm -hmm. the way they interacted with us. I mean, we had them fly between an old windmill in our office where we had DVRs and it'll date us, but originally we had, you know, VCRs and that type of camera equipment and it would burn out circuitry when they would fly between us, uh, wipe VHS tapes clean, uh, make cars go crazy. The lights flash, just typical things you see in movies we experienced out there. Um, and then, you know, it gets into so, just so intricate that, even the colors of the light balls, it denoted what type of light ball activity you were going to have. The white ones were more benign. The yellow ones could go either way. The red ones were the ones particularly Ted experienced that showed they, they just showed extreme amounts of energy. And they were like Ted used to say were the bad guys. They were the ones that preceded what we called the unseen force. And 
the unseen force is something that would knock down steel gates that were log chained together, uh, push trucks up driveways that had, didn't have an engine in them and, uh, knock people down. Uh, so, I mean, we just had so many different types of anomalies out there. Uh, there's a catalog that Ted actually wrote on everything we dealt with. Have, have any of you ever felt threatened or have been injured by any of these forces? And I know you have to be careful right now because you are working on a few projects and, and we have to, um, that's why we're being kind of innocuous and it's a shorter interview today, but right. has there been true danger for you or any of the other investigators? I, I will say, I can say now because Ted didn't like to draw any attention to this because he felt it would take away from his research and the fo lose focus of what he was trying to do. But uh, yes, there, I mean, myself included and Ted, we had been injured out there and uh, I could go into that sometime, but uh, yeah, Ted and I've been injured. Others have been injured at Marley uh, from these forces and uh, the light beam activity, which is another highly strange, it's a sweeping light beam that sweeps the area and can, can injure people in some instances. So, uh, yes, it exhibits physical force on us and people and animals, I will say. One last question in this segment with you is, are you noticing a broadening of its range? Is it going further? I noticed that Skinwalker Ranch, people on, on, um, you know, connecting properties are starting to have weird experiences. It's pouring over. Are we seeing that growth pattern in Marley Woods? No, we, no, no, we are not. And, um, and I will tell you, I'm in contact with a property owner, a site one, almost every week, if not every couple of weeks. Uh, and the man will call me anytime a night or day when something happens and he logs it. And the man is a, is just a, he keeps journals and logs. He's a meticulous writer, which is great for us. But, uh, you know, it, that has not occurred in Marley. It stayed localized at the, the two ranches. And uh, for whatever reason, we don't know. But it has not spread out. And uh, now some of the light ball activity and the occurrence of structured craft can be seen from different vantage points adjacent to the ranches. but as far as the, the really activity, high strangeness has maintained right at Marley Woods for whatever reason. So we're at this point where I'm, I'm fascinated by the stories, obviously, you, you know, I'm going to share with people in this episode, the links for, um, the uh your your facebook page also for the uh for the facebook page ted phillips marley woods research center so people can keep in in contact and and see that and get more information right um before you leave normally this is the point i would say goodbye i i have an email from a listener that i was going to read but knowing what you know and seeing what you've seen i wonder if you'd stay on and let me read this email and you could weigh in on on your thoughts that'd be great okay uh, this email uh, comes to us from uh, Justin Filia. Targeted is the topic of this. Dave, I believe it all started in November of 2010. My son was just born a month earlier in Nashville, Tennessee, where me and my ex-wife were living at the time. My son was in the hospital for the first three weeks of his life, and it led to me losing my job. So a month later, in November of 2010, we moved back to my home of uh, Lake City, South Carolina, so my family could help with my son and I would have a job at our family business. Now, one night, I woke up outside my house, wrapped in a blanket underneath my Jeep, and it was running. It was the sound of the running engine that woke me up. I looked towards the front of the Jeep and I saw a green fluorescent looking light hovering over the ground. It was the size of a basketball, and as I got up from under the Jeep to see what it was, it shot straight up and into the sky. I ran back to the uh, front door to go inside, scared out of my mind, but the door was locked. Now, it didn't dawn on me until after I banged on the door to get my ex's attention to unlock the door that we only had one key and the deadbolt was locked from the inside. She had the only key inside with her, plus all of our alarms were still armed. 
Now, there's no way I ended up outside with that door locked and the key inside unless my ex, who weighs all of 110 pounds, put me there, which I can assure you she did not. It left me terrified. I started having dreams and visions of things that tie into what you would refer to as reptilian or demonic creatures. Fast forward to 2014, I started noticing SUVs and trucks following me everywhere. Now, I thought it was the cops. I was on probation. I finally got the nerve up to go ask one of them why they were following me. They just laughed, like the creepiest laugh I've ever heard. And I asked, are you, are you the cops? If so, just arrest me already. But then he suddenly stopped laughing and said, you'll wish we were the cops by the time this is over. And at that point, he drove off. I freaked out and decided to leave the state, blowing off probation to start a new life somewhere else, and I headed west. First Nevada, then to California, then Seattle, and all the way back to South Carolina, where I was finally arrested and served prison for the probation violation in 2017. During prison, I was approached by a guard who said that he could get me a cool job on the outside, and that would help keep me out of trouble and ensure I never go back to jail again. I asked more about it, and he said that it would make all the people following me stop. And I would finally know how the world really works. He then hysterically laughed at me and said he was just kidding, that we'll never stop and we're everywhere. He left that day and never returned to work again. Now, two weeks later, I was released and I moved back to Nashville to work on music and met the woman who's now my wife. That's when the nightmare began all over again. She's witnessed it and it scared her to death. We're in fear for our lives, so we hit the road again. We went everywhere, and we were stalked to extreme measures. We went to Louisiana, then back to Texas, which is where my wife is from. And that's when I started getting burned on my upper legs and my feet, to the point that my skin pigment is forever changed, and it's still happening. I'm at my wit's end. This has all been so terrifying, and I believe I may have implants as I have two unknown scars where I think they may be located. I'm just so tired of all of this, and I needed someone to know. And that's from Justin Filia. I would guess these aren't surprising tactics or stories that you're hearing. No, they're not. No, they're not. And What insights it's... do you have for Justin on this? I, I will tell you, it sounds like, a, and you have to be so careful, the individual in the interview, but it sounds like a classic, you know, abduction scenario possible. Uh, and we did experience one of those in Marley and a very, very real ca case that cannot be explained. And very similar to that actual story, too, about a special needs child that went out one morning, uh, had a habit of running out. The parents fixed him a breakfast, favored breakfast. It had snowed lightly, and, and the special needs child went out barefoot. Uh, they called farm breakfast was ready. He wasn't around. Two days later, they had the sheriff's department out, searched the pond, couldn't find the kid. They drove the pond. They thought maybe got in the pond. Two days later, there's a knock on the door. The mother opens the door. The child comes in. No idea that that time frame had passed. He wanted to know where his breakfast was. So for that individual, where he was for two days in the cold and snow, and he didn't show any signs of wear, of, uh, you know. Hypothermia, nothing, Hypothermia, right? uh, frostbite, anything like that. His feet weren't injured, and he was barefoot. As far as he was concerned, two days had passed. When he went out that door and came back, it was a matter of minutes for him. And there were other things that were seen in that area. Uh, and some structured craft in that area. So I will tell you that it does happen and it can be very real. And uh, what would you suggest? My, my initial reaction would have been to reach out to a local chapter of MUFON to share yeah. this story because MUFON is open to the concepts in this, and but he's feeling attacked. He believes he has implants, his legs are being burned and it's so much it's changing the pigment of his skin. Is this a MUFON style investigation or is there somebody else he should be talking to? Uh, absolutely. I would say to get, get in touch with this local MUFON. And if they don't have the ability there, they know people within MUFON. And I've sat in on regression therapy. And it's not done as often as what you would think. But they do have the capability 
and competent people, psychologists that can do regression. And uh, it, it has to be based on the individual. They have to weigh if they feel it'll be beneficial to the certain individual, if it'll help them out, or in some instance, uh, they may not want to know everything or can handle everything. But uh, I have sat in on those sessions and it can be very beneficial. But yeah, I would I would seek out a MUFON, your chapter there, and talk to the people. If the local chapter doesn't have the ability, they can pass it on and get competent people that will handle this. And Great. Uh, because usually talking with someone that listens and there's no ridicule is very beneficial for someone right. like that. Of course. And Thomas, thank you so much for coming on and sharing your insights. And we'd love to have you come back, fill us in on, on new insights, investigations, and things that are going on. Will you do that for us? Oh, I would love to. I would love Perfect. to. It's thank you so much. It's been a pleasure speaking to you again. We're going to have links up so that you can find Mr. Ferrario's Facebook page and the Research Center Facebook page. Make sure to join me coming up March 4th through the 6th. The Mystic and Mystery Weekend is going to be taking place in Waynesboro, Pennsylvania at the 1912 Haunted Historic Hoover House. You can find information at darknessevents.com. That's darkness events.com that's the best way to uh, keep up with all of the cool locations i'm going to be visiting this year there is ghost hunts there is all types of great uh, vendors it'll be there you can get um reiki akashic readings psychic and tarot readings runes aura photography and more so make sure that you go check out darkness events Dot com. Stay tuned. We've got more coming your way. You're listening to the best in paranormal podcasting. This is the Paranormal 60. Our next guest is someone I respect, and I reach out to often to pick his brain regarding strange phenomena. His analytical mind and unique perspective always helps me to see other sides of the activity that people claim to witness. He's the host and lead investigator of the hit Discovery Plus series, UFO Witness, and he's appeared on many other programs. Please welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the Paranormal 60, our good friend, Ben Hansen. Hello, Ben. Hey, Dave. How's it going? Doing good. Hey, before we get um, pick up on, on talking about the Marley Woods, I want to mention there are two really cool shock docs that are dropping this week on Discovery Plus, and uh, the first one is alien abduction, Betty and Barney Hill. Give us a little insight on this. So, um, yeah, I was invited uh, as, as they were kind of well into production on these two shock docs that look at um, what I consider the most iconic UFO alleged abductions, you know, in history. And Betty Barney Hill took place in the early 60s. Uh, there's a lot of, of uh, unique angles about this one because um, they were an interracial couple, which was not popular at the time. Um, they were not your, your typical, um, I guess, reporting people that, you know, would say that they saw something really crazy. So they were reluctant witnesses, which I like. And, and basically New Hampshire, they'd taken a trip up to, um, to Canada or on the way back. And, um, they experienced, uh, a, a really close sighting of a UFO that turned into missing time. Um, and then they were later regressed through hypnosis. Bud Hopkins got involved. Um, Jalen Hynek from Project Blue Book. Um, you know, Blue Book had a case on it. So it, it, I think that the thing that really intrigues me about this case the most is that after all these years, I was still able to, um, uh, both on UFO Witness and then with the Shock Doc, go back and add something to it. You know, there's still leads of things that we're following up on. Yeah. Um, that, that tend to corroborate the story that they told. It's quite amazing. Yeah, it is. And this is one of the few stories that, again, through the the entire pantheon of abduction scenario and stories, amazingly holds up in an interesting way. And like you said, because these are two people that did not want to draw unwanted attention at that time. And the facts, if I remember correctly, and I'm sure we're going to deep, you know, deep dive into it in the documentary, uh, they gave a lot of information that, in later years was corroborated and proved to be true. At least that's what we've been led to believe to this point. So you'll have to check out Alien Abduction, Betty and Barney Hill, Discovery Plus running. It uh, it airs, I might as well put this up so that way we uh, 
We're making sure we do the, the oh. justice streaming on Discovery no, Plus. You, yeah, uh -huh. <laughs> beginning February 18th, and it'll continue to air there. But this next story, I, I, Betty and Barney Hill, like I said, has always fascinated me. But this one really hits home because I'm friends with the guy. And, and to hear Travis mm. Walton, his story, and to see him tell the tale and know all of the intricacies, intricacies behind it, this is, again, one of the most impressive alien abduction stories. And I know you're more of a skeptic when it comes to these things, but what do you think of Travis? Yeah, so, I mean, everybody that I know growing up had seen the movie Fire in the Sky. And that, you know, freaked me out. Like, so many people's like, oh, my gosh, if this is what aliens are doing, and, you know, they're putting us in cocoons and probing us through our nose and eyes. And um, But so I, I was already kind of like, intrigued because you had seven witnesses right who saw the craft and saw travis get shot backwards with some type of a, a bolt of electricity but i was um in 2000 and i think it was 10 i was filming factor effect on sci-fi channel and it's a story that we may have taken on except there was no video or photo with it right um but i wanted to meet the guy when i learned he was still alive and i had a mutual friend so we went back actually with Travis to the um, the site back in 2010 or 11 in the first time. And, and Travis and I met um, <laughs> at, a, at a Mexican cafe and we were both kind of looking at each other, you know, testing out like, do I trust this guy? Is he telling me the truth? And after hearing the story from him personally and reading the book, which I, I suggest everyone does because it's very, very different than what they did in the movie. It's far more believable. And it's the most well-documented case, I think, in, in uh, abduction history. So, again, this is another case where we're still adding um, value to it because of the leads. Uh, I've been to the site, I think, seven times now. And we've discovered things that, um, that really support what the crew saw, what they believed. And, and I fully believe uh, Travis. It, it's an incredible story. Let me ask you something. You know about drones right? I had a chance to film an episode of Ghost Adventures. We did uh, uh, an investigation at the Stardust Ranch in Arizona. Uh -huh. And part of that took us to meet with Travis Walton and go to that site. And something very strange, you know, they shoot the drone up to get some overhead sky footage of the trees in the area. And what was weird is when the camera turned up and you could see the trees as it was going up, the sky kept like matrixing out. It looked like like the old gray screens of TVs that weren't getting a channel. You yeah, could see yeah. every other detail of trees and everything else, but the skies were, it, was that some kind of weird phenomenon or is that just because it was such <laughs> an expansive sky, the, the camera's trying to find something to lock in on. Was it only appearing that way in the camera or yeah. like you're sitting? Yeah, well, as we're watching the footage on the little handheld oh, device. Yeah. I, I probably see, it's probably something to do with the reception yeah, but we could and, see the trees were in perfect, perfect focus. Weird. But you could, as as you looked at, I looked at Billy Tolly at the time, and I'm like, "What's going on?" He goes, "I don't know. I've never seen this." And I go, "This is directly over the spot." And he goes, "Yeah, this is weird." Well, this there is, is really a weird. slight, a very slight, uh, and I don't know if it's, um, I, you know, like anything that that is anomalous. But while we were there, the there is, uh, if you take your your compass. Um, it does seem like there's some geological um, feature that pulls the compass off of true north a little bit. So, and that that's common in a lot of places. In fact, when I'm you know flying planes, sometimes on air charts they'll write on there, "Beware, your compass could be off by this many degrees." So it does have a little bit of that there. I just don't know like if that was causing your <laughs> your image problems. It was weird. Alien abduction, Travis Walton. Again, that begins airing February 18th. There I am, Ben. Do you recognize <laughs> that is the phone booth? Uh, I, For those of you listening to the audio version of this, I'm standing in the actual phone booth. It still exists. It's like some kind of like Jurassic Park, right? You go out there and it's in between these two buildings and there's the actual phone booths that he went into naked and tried to call for help. And, and get no, he wasn't to naked up. though. That was the movie. <laughs> That's what we find out in the documentary. Yes. <laughs> Let's leave it. Let's leave them wanting more. But right, that was <laughs> fast. So I should have kept my pants on in that picture is what you're saying. Ben. <laughs> <laughs> but 
Uh, it's all streaming beginning on February 18th. So check that out. Now, Ben, we were obviously we were talking about uh, the mystery and monsters of Marley Woods. And I'm curious, you know, again, somebody who's analytical looks at a lot of these stories. Fact or faked? Huh? How do you like that throwback? <laughs> So uh, I'll, I'll start just by saying um, back in, uh, it was 2000 and, uh, well, about the same time as Fact or Fake, 2011, I think, I went to my first ever MUFON meeting. And at the MUFON meeting, um, Ted Phillips was speaking. So Ted Phillips, and you may have already covered this, but was the protege of Jalen Hynek. Uh, he specialized, and Hynek asked him to, to do trace evidence. He's like, this should be your specialty. So he went to gosh, in their database, over 3,000 landing cases. Uh, and many of those had trace evidence uh, involved. And so he gave this presentation and then he talked about this place he called Marley Woods, Woods which is a pseudonym for a, a secret place that he wasn't ready to reveal. And I was blown away. I mean, they were showing videos of orb-like lights and stuff that were responding intelligently. Uh, the ranchers there that were having livestock killed, you know, and at, at the time I was also big into Skinwalker Ranch, which was really not very well known. I, I'd read the book um, and I was like, oh my gosh. And, and I went up to Ted after and I said, you'd mentioned Skinwalker Ranch, but the stuff that's happening there is just as incredible, if not more so. Right. And uh, he's like, yeah, I know. And I said, well, have you been in touch with Bigelow or anybody in Come to find out he had been. I don't think he told me at the time. But there's there's parallels. And so a lot of these weird ranches, it's something that I've kind of um, personally taken an interest in finding similarities, you know, between um, what what makes a, a certain ranch or rural place what I call the parapalooza of paranormal activity. Right. There's so much going on, right? Portals opening, creatures coming out, uh, wolf-like creatures eating cattle. And so many credible down to earth uh, ranchers have nothing to gain by making these things up. And uh, it, it's probably gone on for hundreds, if not thousands of years, if you go back and you look at the Native American, you know, uh, histories with it. So very, very fascinating stuff. Uh, we had, a, I'll have to send you the video, Ben, and I'll, I'll play it in a couple of weeks here, folks, for you. But we I had a really strange story from a rancher uh who talked about creatures and he focused on one story of this like bigfoot creature that kept trying to mate with the cows them to mate with the cows like it was that's confused. what he that's what he was <laughs> assuming it kept going behind the cows and the cows would start getting <laughs> agitated so he ended up shooting his gun up over the thing's head and it took off over the fence and oh they had gosh. they had um uh they had cattle mutilations they had lights in the sky and whenever they would see the lights in the sky within a day or two they would find one of the cattle barbecued up and barbecued just... or complaining that it was molested. Right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so it's it it was really kind of a fun but it's a fun little story uh I'll I'll play for you guys in the future but I'll send you over the uh the video of it. If you're looking you can go over to the uh, Paranormal 60 YouTube channel and just scroll down. I think it's called Strange Bedfellows is the name of the uh, the story. But yeah, it was it was one of those that I it, you scratch your head. You're like, you things couldn't get any weirder. And then you find out, oh, oh yeah, they can. They can get a lot weirder. <laughs> what about the concept of ley lines, right? And, and these nexus points or connecting points. Is there really something to that scientifically that we can prove? Or is this just tree well, hugging hocus pocus? Um, I mean, if you were to Google it, you'll see ley lines are a pseudo scientific. According to the scientific community, there's, uh, you know, nothing really I, I guess to verify that they exist however you you also can google and look up uh recent studies um I, I think it was done by nasa but they talk about um vortexes or they use the the term wormholes or things like that and between here and the sun there are places where magnetic the magnetic field of the earth and the sun converge and they believe that there is a bending of space time um, I'm not an expert in quantum physics or anything like that, but they at least admit that something weird similar to a black hole could be happening in these places. So why not here on Earth where you have strong magnetic or weak magnetic fields um, where it causes a, a phenomena where things could 
come through from other dimensions. And I still kind of question myself when I use the word interdimensional vortex, but that's what we're talking about, right? And whether it's paranormal and ghosts and spirits or a way for extraterrestrials to travel from far distances, uh, or they're already here, I, I think you'll see a lot of people like Jacques Vallée, who, who investigated both Skinwalker Ranch and, and Marley Woods. Um, you'll see people like him and others uh, that were ahead of their time taking this interdimensional concept more seriously. And, and I think that ley lines might be a part of that, whatever you want to call it, where they're converging. And so we do need to look at these patterns and see, you know, why, why here and why here, what's similar about them. Technology is really impressive now, and there are so many cameras that can view ultraviolet and, and UV and all these different spectrums. When there are these energy portals, these things, are we capturing them on any type of camera where we can see there is a physical disturbance? And if there is, can we tell from which direction? Is it something coming down from the sky? Is it something emanating up from the earth, from the west or the east? What do you know about that? Yeah, I think technology is catching up, and that's what makes it so great because visually um, we can do things in the past, you know, 30, 40 years we couldn't do 100 years ago. So we can see into the ultraviolet and the and the IR, near IR. So we're looking at those spectrums, but I think there's so many other electromagnetic spectrums that we probably haven't even tapped into yet. And so if we could get, um, there are 3D uh, EMF meters, basically, that kind of create a uh, a visualization for you if you could see how the magnetic fields were interacting you could actually walk into a room and kind of map it out and say well there's there's something right here you know and that's what i'm waiting for is is for us to perfect that um that might help us you know but yeah where it's coming from and how it opens up i think people get lucky when they've had photos um at skinwalker for example you know the story of you know looking through the rifle scope and seeing an actual sort of door open and i've got uh, you know a friend who has pictures of it looks like a, a, a figure a human walking through one of those openings um or seeing sky blue sky and trees through the opening when it's dark you know at night so are we looking into another dimension um and you know it's just it seems to be so fleeting you can't really just capture it and, and keep it open. And um, yeah, it, it it's, it's crazy. I just hope that we can definitively say one day that that's what we're seeing. I know you've been a skeptic, a skeptical believer. Skeptic's not a dirty word in our business, right? You should be <laughs> looking at things through more scientific lenses. But as you walk this journey now for so many years, Ben, are you finding yourself more and more open to the holy beep moment of, of situations? <laughs> It, it's both. It's really weird because I think on one hand you get jaded because mm -hmm. so many people are willing to jump to the ridiculous and it can't all be true. Right. And so right. you get, you know, stories and pictures and people sort of a, a, a paranoia that everything's happening. And, and so that is doing us no good. But on the other hand, I think I believe in more strange, unusual uh, phenomena than I did as a kid. So I'd say I, the more that I learn, it's almost like the less that I that I know or think I know. And, and, and that can be frustrating because, you know, everything's possible suddenly. But isn't it interesting that as a child, that was when everything is possible. And now as you're getting older, it's, <laughs> that, that role has flipped for you. You're becoming more childlike in the awe and wonder of being able to be open to these experiences. Absolutely. And because when you're a kid, you trust your parents have all the answers, right? right. Or that scientists do. And then you grow up and you're like, what? That's your explanation for this? You know nothing, you know? There's got to be somebody else, you know, that, that has answers because sure. those in, in authority in the science world, sometimes it, it's uh, ridiculous, the, the arrogance, yep. you know, what we don't know. Ben, thank you for joining us and sharing a little time with us. Remember, everybody, check out the Shock Docs coming up on the 18th. You can watch about Betty and Barney Hill or Travis Walton. Amazing Shock Docs that go in-depth to these stories. And as Ben said, they were able to uncover new nuances to each one of these. And Ben, when are we going to see more UFO Witness? Well, we're wrapping up. Uh, i got about a month left of filming. So I, my best guess is uh, sometime in the summer, I'm, I'm hoping, that it'll air. Thank Fantastic. Well, thank you for coming in, Ben. We appreciate it. Thank you. Take care. Remember to check out Ben at Ben Hansen 
com. That's benhansen.com. Now, Ben has a great quote, stay curious and you'll never be bored. And I have to ask you listeners, hearing what you've heard so far, does that make you question your interest in the paranormal? Does it make you second guess what's going on around you? And how would you respond if you experienced the things documented at the Marley Woods or, or detailed in the email from Justin Filia, Would you reach out for help or check yourself into the first mental health facility that you can find? I'd like to hear from you. You can email me Dave at paranormal60.com. That's Dave at paranormal60.com. Now, ladies and gentlemen, let's have a little fun as we enter a tale of terror. Enter the bloody bones, man. Every child's nightmare is that there are things living under beds and in closets. And what if from time to time those creatures show themselves and prove our worst fears are real? Todd and Alan Standing are brothers. Growing up, they shared a room and bunk beds. When younger brother Alan would find himself frightened, he would often climb to the top bunk to find comfort from his older, braver brother. One night, Todd convinced Alan they could turn off the nightlight and all would be fine. Later that night, he felt the familiar rock of the bunk bed as his little brother climbed up to join him. He laid there until his brother settled in. Finally, Todd rolled to face Alan to see what was wrong. When he did, he came face to face with something grotesque. A blood red man. Like his skin had been totally burned off. He lay there next to the boy, smiling, a large Cheshire cat-like grin, his eyes wide and yellowy, just staring directly into Todd's eyes. Todd was paralyzed in terror, unable to move. He lay there for hours, and not until the earliest signs of sunlight did he decide to do the unthinkable. Todd closed his eyes and rolled away from the hideous man, releasing a single sob. Then he felt the bed move, the blanket shift and the sound of heavy footfalls, followed by the slamming of the closet door. Todd sat on that experience for over 30 years until in a bar, he finally opened up to his now not so little brother. When Todd finished the tale, Alan quietly whispered, that's why I always wanted the light on and the closet door closed. I would see that man there in our closet looking out at us staring, waiting. And I'd like to tell you it was contained to just that random set of brothers, but it wasn't. It's a being many have witnessed, experienced almost exactly the same way to children all across the United States. Yeah, how about that? If you have a crazy story you want to share, email it to me, Dave at paranormal60.com and maybe it'll be featured in a tale of terror coming up it's time to buy the book this is the book we're talking about today by angela wicks the secret psychic unite your hidden spiritual life with your everyday reality this unique and inspiring resource actually shows you how to practice your subtle energetic abilities and fully embrace your spiritual nature even if you feel like you, you can't bet, be yet open about what you're doing to the people around you, Angela Wicks answers your burning questions about what it means to be a secret psychic, how to overcome common challenges, and how to integrate your experience so you don't feel stuck. The secret psychic also helps you understand spirit communication and offers guidance on how to reveal your hidden self to others when you're ready. In addition to more than 20 hands-on practices, you'll find empowering support and professional psychics, mediums, and intuition experts filling in. Check it out by Angela Wicks. We have that if you go to uh, paranormal60.com, click on the store tab at the top of the page, and you can scroll down and find our Amazon shop there. The world is a chaotic, crazy place, and often we find ourselves lost in mindless tasks and missing the magic that's all around us the mysteries and elements of paranormal activity. And people ask me, why do all the TV shows happen at night? Well, the fact is the paranormal happens all the time. There is no rhyme or reason to when and where, and most importantly, the why. Night is when things are quiet, shutting down, and we're not overstimulated and missing subtle signs that things are amiss. 
it's often easier to recognize at night. With that in mind, take time to yourself every day. Turn your gaze away from your electronic devices. Look around you. Be present and in the moment. And I bet when you change the way you look at things, the things you see will begin to change as well. I hope you've enjoyed today's program and thank you for spending your time with us. Happy Valentine's Day to all of you, my little darklings. And I'd like to thank our guests, Thomas M. Ferrario and Ben Hansen for taking us on a journey into the farthest corners of possibility. And thank you all for visiting the Paranormal 60 and allowing me along on your journey. May the darkness be a little more light with the information we shared here. Stay safe and remember, in a world where you can be anything, always be kind. Thank you.